From the Gospel of John, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've been hearing that passage a fair amount lately, have you not? And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So last Friday, I, like uh, some of you, attended the Celebrate America uh, concert in Memorial uh, Park on that uh, nice, cool uh, Friday evening. <laughs> uh, it's a great concert. It's Little Stephen and the uh, Disciples of Stoll were playing, Little Stephen being uh, uh, the former uh, guitarist uh, for Bruce Springsteen. And uh, Chris Isaacs was playing, as well as a local band called The Firms. And I was all excited to get to the concert. Um, uh, but I uh, thought, you know, I was going to go join some friends. I thought, oh, I'm going to bring some, a veritable feast along with me so we can enjoy this on the grass. And so I packed my uh, trusty cooler uh, with such things as uh, alder smoked salmon that I'd smoked that morning accompanied by the cream cheese and the capers and the crackers. And I kept that all cool by, uh, with a six-pack of an ice-cold beverage that I put in the freezer for an hour before putting it in the bottom of the cooler, as well as a couple of bottles of uh, tall bottles of chilled uh, beverage uh, uh, in there as well, and some uh, seltzer water. Um, bear in mind, all, not all this was for me. It was to share, right? Uh, and uh, as I picked this thing up, I was realizing, oh, I really should have packed this in that little wheeled cooler that I had. It was pretty, pretty heavy. And so I, I made my way from the car uh, toward the, the park. And as I'm lugging this thing, kind of changing hands because it's really heavy, uh, I uh, noticed in, uh, up, up coming up is uh, a man and a woman standing on either side of the sidewalk distributing uh, pamphlets, free pamphlets to everyone. And in front of them uh, was this uh, uh, large sandwich board sign uh, with the quote you just heard from scripture on it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except uh, through me. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> oh boy. Uh, <clears throat> I was tempted to walk right past them <laughs> Uh, but, you know, there's something about being here on the Tri-Faith campus uh, when, where we have lots of Jewish and Muslim friends that makes me less and less willing simply to remain silent as if my silence I implies agreement with uh, what, is, what is being done there. And I, as I was approaching them, I thought back to um, actually a section that I'd written in my uh, book, Asphalt Jesus, uh, years ago that the publisher asked uh, me to remove because they felt it would be too controversial. Uh, in that section, I relate a story of being invited onto an L.A. radio show for an interview one morning during the morning commute. The, uh, the producer said it would be a friendly interview. It turned out to be an ambush. Uh, the, the radio host uh, was quite disturbed by the fact that I was publicly claiming that uh, the God who loves us all beyond our wildest imagination would never throw God's children into an eternal torture uh, chamber. Uh, he felt very convinced that only Christians get in and everybody else goes to a very uh, bad place, not, uh, not heaven. And so now after the interview, um, I put the phone down and started to go about my day's work when my mother calls, who had been listening over the internet to this, uh, this radio interview, and she said, Eric, you better get on the internet and listen to what's happening He's taking calls, and you're getting hammered. <laughs> and sure enough, I got back on, I was listening, and people were accusing me of being everything short of Satan himself, leading people on the slippery slope straight into the fires of hell. Now, in the section they wanted me to cut, I actually speculated, well, what if I were Satan? And, and if I wanted to undo everything Jesus came and stood for? everything, just reverse it all, what would I do? Well, I thought for a moment, well, maybe I would make you know, all-out war on Christians. 
then I realized that Christian history clearly shows that <laughs> persecution actually increased, strengthens Christianity. That does not uh, weaken uh, Christianity. Uh, in the Roman times, uh, the early days of the church, the Romans literally couldn't kill enough Christians to keep up with all the converts who were inspired by those who would rather die serving Jesus as Lord than live serving Caesar as, as Lord. It's almost as, as if Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake uh, will find it. All right, so scratch the war thing. Um, and I thought, well, maybe I'd do the opposite, actually. I would convince Christians that they are perfectly at peace, that, that there's nothing they can do that will separate from them from God, which I believe is true. Uh, but I would say, you know, therefore you can do whatever you want, and it doesn't matter. You know, you can uh, indulge in all the rampant consumerism you want. You can exploit the poor if you want, not being concerned about their, their plight. You can wage wars with whoever you think is your enemy. You can do all these things, and hey, as long as you love Jesus, you're forgiven. He's borne all your sins. Well, that might reverse everything Jesus came for uh, as well. So that, that held possibilities. But really what I, I came up with, uh, if I could just have one thing, I, I would trade all those other techniques. Just one thing that I would try to do if I were Satan, uh, I realized, and that is I would instill in the human consciousness the suggestion, not the certainty, but just the suggestion that if you do not please the God of your understanding in a certain way, God might just throw you into a torture chamber for all of eternity. That's what I'd do. Because if people took that seriously, that's just the suggestion, because even if they thought that was kind of crazy, but there's a chance that it might be true, that would start to work its way into their, their consciousness, their psyche, and concern them quite greatly. They would realize that, well, wow, if I could lose my salvation because, for instance, I have doubts about my faith, well, then they would rush to do everything they could to never ask questions, never have doubts about their faith. And they would also rush to make sure that they're, the people they love never doubted their faith, lest they lose their salvation. In this way, fear would vastly overcome love. Fear would also vastly overcome critical thinking. Yeah. But not only that, I mean, if someone had this sense that they could lose their salvation not just for themselves, but somebody else who they loved could, could do that if they didn't come to know Jesus in a certain way, didn't make a certain affirmation about him, then they would, any loving and compassionate person would try to convert every person they cared about uh, by hook or by crook even. I mean, they'll thank you in the end, right? Uh, if, if you've swindled them into the faith, if you've done a bait and switch, what have, whatever, um, you know, they will thank you. It would actually turn every ounce of love and compassion from genuinely loving and compassionate people holding this belief, it would actually start them spreading fear uh, rather than love. It would turn every ounce of compassion into a fearful act, not simply a loving act. In fact, you know, what plane, airplane, would you not get on and turn to your seatmate asking, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? What minister on the radio wouldn't you attack for being a spawn of Satan for suggesting that God loves all people and keeps loving all people for eternity? And might you be down at Memorial Park handing out pamphlets, engaging in a bit of spiritual terrorism to win souls to a loving God? Well, you might imagine why the publisher asked me to remove that section. Uh, apparently, someone already thought about instilling that thought in people's minds. I think there might be leftovers. From one of my favorite scriptures, the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
All things came into being through him, and without him, not one thing came into being. So I set down my bag and uh, struck up a conversation uh, with the, the woman who was uh, underneath the shade of a tree wearing a, a long dress uh, for a hot, such a hot day and a scarf and children playing next to her. She handed me the, the pamphlet uh, and I asked, um, you know, now what about my Jewish and Muslim friends? What happens to them after they die? And that led to the conversation you might expect. Uh, I listened a whole lot. Uh, to what she and then eventually her husband had to say and then I would ask a, a question or make an observation that seemed to stump them so they'd say well you ought to read this pamphlet too and anyway I, I left there with a lot of pamphlets <laughs> in my in my in my pocket uh, neither side seems to have been converted um, uh, to the, the the thought or uh, belief of the other other side but I thought well at least it was registered that not every Christian walking by uh, uh, believes this but I, I sat down with my, found my friends and sat down with my, uh, my cooler and prepared for the concert and I thought about that, that, that statement again, that, that I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes into the Father except through me. You know, there's, uh, that's one of my favorite, that also is one of my favorite scriptures. Uh, the, the two passages really are, uh, to me, some of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture. However, the way they, the, 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 the I am the way, the truth, and life is interpreted, though, is deeply disturbing uh, to me, and, and part of this is because of the way it has been translated in the past. You see, the King James Version um, reads this way, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The more modern translations will say, like the New Rise Standard Version, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, the difference is that it's a Greek word called dia, which could be translated either Either way, uh, but modern translators realize that given the context, it's through, not uh, by. And there's a number of reasons for that. But, but just observe that if, if, if no one comes to the Father except by Jesus, it sounds like Jesus is the guardian of the way. He's the keeper of the gate. You know, he is the one who, who actually prevents uh, people from coming through. And then it's only by him then that they can pass through. If it's, if it's no one comes to the Father except through me, then Jesus is the way, the passage itself, not the guardian of the passage. Jesus is the way, not simply the guardian of a, a way that is closed and must be opened by him to allow uh, entrance. So, well, what does, that, what does that mean then? Well, the first chapter of the Gospel of John tells us what it, what it means because it uses the same word with respect to Christ, the, the through uh, word And, of course, the gospel writer thought you'd read this passage before you read chapter 14, right? They're both related. They're both meant to be read in context of the whole gospel. John 1 said, in the beginning was the word, or logos of God. That's an allusion to the Christ of God. And the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him. And without him, not one thing came into being. In other words, every single created thing in the universe is an incarnation of God's love that has become incarnate through Christ. The Christ of God is literally in all things because all things were created through this Christ. So, it's not a matter of asking if you are in relationship with God. No, you are already in relationship with God, whether you realize it or not, because you are a created being, and therefore you are yourself an incarnation of God's love. So what this means is if you want to understand, uh, you know, look to, uh, God, you, and, and, and God's love, well, look to Jesus for sure. But don't just look at Jesus, look through him. Jesus is the human lens by which we, Christians come to know that all things are manifestations, incarnations of God's love and grace, that all things are. So don't just look at Jesus, look through him to see that if you want to you know what God looks like, you know, it's not just Jesus, it's also the trees out there. God's love looks like a tree or flowing a brook. 
God's love feels like the breeze against your face. God, if you want to know what God tastes like, tastes something. You know, all these things, all the senses are avenues, become avenues by which when we are mindful of them, we discover ways that God loves us and cares about us. And the fact that these come to anybody, no matter how sinful or non-sinful you are, also indicates that God is not just loving, but supremely gracious <laughs> with all of us. So, as I open my cooler, I'm sorry there aren't extras in here. I, we were all a little hungry that day. Um, I experienced Christ at Memorial Park. I experienced Christ in the form of alder smoked salmon. And therefore, I gave thanks for the, the body of that salmon, which had been broken for me and my friends. I gave thanks for the trees, the alder trees, that had been, whose bodies were cut for me and my friends. I gave thanks for the cracker I ate, and the, the wheat that had grown in the fields, and the fields themselves that had nurtured the, the wheat, and the, the farm workers and farm hands who had tended that wheat. I gave thanks for the fact that, that that wheat had been transported by somebody to a mill that ground it into flour, and that somebody did this, and somebody turned it again into a cracker, and more and more people were involved in this whole thing until it finally reached Trader Joe's, where I put, took it off the shelf, and then put it in my mouth and crunch to taste God's love. And then there's the cream cheese and the cherries. <laughs> more and more and more to give thanks for. I realized that if the economist Milton Friedman could, could name 300 peaceful processes that must take place around the world in order to produce a single number two pencil... There were all kinds of peaceful interactions that took place between people from all over the world and with creation itself in order to produce this little mini feast in my cooler. And then, of course, there was the grass in the park and the, the trees, the, the breeze that finally came up. And then all those musicians, those dozens of musicians who had devoted their lives to creating beauty. There was so much to give thanks for. I, I, you know, I just kept, kept coming and coming and coming. Experiencing the love of God incarnate in everything around me. Now, I realized that the hell that the pamphleteers talked about uh, must, you know, that, that, they, that say is full of people who are not connected to God must be pretty empty because all things are so connected to God already. Yet then I realized, according to this manner of thinking, maybe hell's a little more full than I had realized. I mean, hell is something we all enter now and again, isn't it? Hell is being surrounded by God at all times and failing to notice. Hell is being filled with God, tasting God, feeling God, touching God, and thinking that God is nowhere close to you. Hell is attending a concert in Memorial Park filled with 60,000 people and dozens of musicians and feeling like none of them are connected to God in any way or few of them and few of them will ever taste heaven. 